good to be back and uh, see old faces again and new faces um, and be in the hot seat once more here. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, different kinds of cardiovascular support and, and what are the COAG issues that are related to them. So first of all, when we talk about cardiopulmonary support, um, the human heart and lungs can be assisted or even replaced for a limited time using a variety of technologies that we'll talk about. Cardiopulmonary bypass, CPB, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, ventricular assist devices, VAD, and uh, ventricular VAD, and artificial hearts. A significant issue of all of these systems is control of bleeding and clotting when blood comes into contact with the artificial surface of the device, and we'll talk about that. So first, a little brief intro into uh, cardiopulmonary support. So what we'll really talk about is kind of two things here, uh, uh, the two parameters that are important. One is the duration that they use these um, technologies. Uh, and the other is the kind of procedure that's involved when you implement them. So for cardiopulmonary bypass, this is for open heart surgery, and it typically lasts for hours. Uh, and it requires, of course, an open heart procedure. Uh, for ECMO, it can last for days, sometimes for maybe a week or two, and it uses percutaneous catheters. So you're really not doing an open chest procedure like you, norm like you would with CPB. Ventricular assist devices require uh, a thoracotomy. They can last for days or even months. Uh, some patients have been on them uh, for quite a long time. And artificial hearts we'll talk about just briefly because they're not used as commonly. Uh, people are on those, obviously, for months, uh, potentially for years. The hope was for them to be a permanent replacement, um, but they haven't really worked out um, quite to the extent that people had hoped. So this is going to be kind of the outline for the talk. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about total artificial hearts, complete cardiac replacement, uh, ventricular assist devices, cardiac support only, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, short-term support, uh, kind of the prototype for cardiopulmonary support, uh, and then we'll talk at the end uh, about ECMO uh, and about current anticoagulation issues related to it, uh, bleeding and clotting issues, and then future approaches to improving ECMO hemostasis and thrombosis. So first, uh, examples of the uh, total artificial heart. Uh, this was one uh, called the uh, Abiacor, uh, and uh, you can sort of see the, the heart here uh, replacing the, uh, the uh, dysfunctioning heart. Um, this one had battery packs inside, uh, and then it was essentially recharged from the outside. So it was, in a sense, total internal uh, artificial heart uh, that was continuously recharged. Uh, this shows another version of an artificial heart. Um, this one had uh, two pulsatile chambers that uh, essentially mimicked uh, the kind of pulse that you would get with the normal heart. And so what are the issues with these? Well, there's a couple of them that relate from the standpoint uh, of COAG. Uh, they all pump pretty well, but the issues are turbulence and shearing, and you get um, COAG platelet activation from that. And then you can get areas of stasis where the blood flow is both turbulent and then isn't mixing and flowing out well enough, and you can get clot formation in those areas. And then again, you have the artificial surface, the surface that the blood is coming in contact with, which can lead to coag activation and platelet activation, complement activation, and leukocyte activation. Uh, and the artificial surface, along with the turbulence and the stasis issues, uh, then can lead to clotting problems and clot development in the heart. Uh, and so, of course, the, a big issue with these is that if you develop a clot, particularly, let's say, uh, most worrisome probably on the left side, because then it's going out into the general circulation and you can then get emboli. And so you could have uh, myocardial infarction or stroke or peripheral uh, infarction, et cetera, from these devices. And so then, of course, what they have to do is anticoagulate the patient to try to reduce this clotting risk. And so then you get into the, the standard sort of teeter-totter that we all deal with for hemostasis, and that is, you know, sort of bleeding versus clotting issues and trying to balance those two. So hope was to replace for artificial hearts, uh, failing hearts permanently, uh, but the current systems still have problems with surface activation, clotting in the system, uh, and then bleeding and stroke. Uh, bridge to transport, excuse me, bridge to transplantation. Uh, it was really uh, hope that it could be uh, what would be called destination therapy, meaning that you would permanently get a replacement artificial heart uh, and not need to go on further. They aren't used that commonly 
uh, and they require really a combination of heparin, warfarin, uh, aspirin, or other antiplatelet agents, and there are a variety of protocols, uh, and I was only going to briefly mention these because they're probably used the least of all the different technologies we're talking about. Uh, another important technology are ventricular assist devices. Uh, and so you can see here, um, we have uh, a catheter essentially put in through the left ventricle, and then we have the pump, and then another catheter that's attached to the aorta. And so it can completely replace uh, the ventricle of the heart. Uh, the connections are a little bit simpler in a sense than what you would use for total artificial heart where you're taking the heart out, of course. So the pump is directly attached to the heart through an open heart procedure. It provides only circulatory support. So cardiac support only, no oxygenation. The heart continues to function supplemented by the ventricular assist device. It can be attached to the left ventricle, the right ventricle, or both. Uh, it has short lines, a minimum surface exposure to blood, um, roughly at least from one um, a source of uh, data, about 2,500 adult implantations per year. Uh, pediatric uh, LVADs, I had a harder time finding good data on all of them, but it's, it's more in the hundreds per year uh, for that. Uh, can be maintained long term, months to years, uh, used to support patients needing short term cardiac support. Uh, or for chronic heart failure waiting for transplant. This shows uh, sort of a history, at least from one data set, uh, of LVAD implantations, and you can say it's kind of leveled off uh, at the point that it's now kind of in, at least from this data set, at about 2,500 per year. This shows an example of a pediatric LVAD where they're supporting both the right and the left ventricle. And so uh, you've got essentially one uh, catheter as an outflow track and one going back in. Uh, and then this was a Berlin heart and it uh, uses a pulsatile chamber that's pneumatically driven from the outside. Now, the pulsatile LVADs, uh, the idea was that it was going to pump like a normal heart, that you would have a, you know, sort of a pumping action like our heart does, uh, and that was thought potentially to be more physiologic. But in fact, they've had more issues with turbulence and clot formation on these, uh, and they're really um, essentially sort of disappearing. This shows um, survival. Uh, for medical management, uh, for a pulsatile left ventricular assist device, and then for the uh, continuous flow. And you can see that the uh, survival is actually better for the continuous flow devices. Uh, and these days, at least from the data set I could find, about 95% of the LVADs that are going in nowadays are some form of continuous flow. So artificial surface and shear forces leads to platelet and coag activation again, uh, like we've talked about. Without any coagulation, you'll get clot deposition uh, in the VAD. Um, but you have a smaller surface area, so it means less activation, less complex anticoagulation. Patients are anticoagulated with heparin typically after surgery and transition to warfarin and aspirin if the system is continued longer. Some patients will be on these for months uh, waiting for transplant. Uh, some essentially who aren't uh, uh, a good candidate for transplant for various reasons that this essentially has become sort of destination therapy and, and people are on these for quite a long time. Uh, issues that they have with these include uh, thoracic and uh, gastrointestinal bleeding are common problems, uh, along with embolic stroke, again, particularly if it's a, 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 a left ventricular assist device. Uh, then if you form clot in the device, then it can shower these emboli uh, and you can suffer stroke from that. Uh, Six-month survival is a bridge to transplant uh, from a data set in 2011 was about 93%. So people are surviving very well on these, and like, you know, 90% of the people could live for at least six months waiting for a transplant. So the LVADs work really quite well. They have a small surface area, and they're uh, easier um, in some ways to put in for the catheter connections uh, than something like a total artificial heart. So one of the other things that's sort of interesting about these is the effect they can have on some of the uh, coag factors. So if we look at von Willebrand factor, the circulatory support devices cause shearing of the blood uh, across the valves in the device sometimes and in the device itself, uh, potentially in the pump. Uh, and this shearing results in destruction of high molecular weight von Willebrand factor, resulting in a form of acquired von Willebrand's disease. Uh, and this has been associated with uh, gastrointestinal bleeding and angio angiodysplasia in the GI tract. Uh, it can be treated with VWF concentrates, um, still being studied to prevent 
uh, and try to treat the, the uh, LVAD-associated bleeding. Uh, you can see here, this is sort of a showing in uh, von Willebrand factor multimers. These are uh, sort of small multimers, and this is the high molecular weight multimers up here. And you can see that uh, for the time, if the longer they're on uh, the device, that the high molecular weight multimers go down. And if you remember, von Willebrand factor is like uh, double sticky tape, uh, and so longer pieces are better. Uh, it sticks down to the wound, and then uh, platelets will stick to that. Uh, um, and so shorter pieces of tape just don't work as well, right? Uh, and so as you chop up the tape, then the smaller pieces aren't as sticky and don't work as well. Uh, so they're still studying what's the best way to treat this and whether concentrates should be used, uh, an active area of research, uh, but not a clear uh, understanding of what should be done yet. So let's talk about uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, really one of the first technologies developed uh, needed for open heart surgery, complete replacement of heart and lung function. So you're getting, uh, that's the pulmonary part of course, you get oxygenation as part of it. The duration here is hours typically. Uh, and now the other thing that's important to think about for the artificial heart and for the LVAD, these were really uh, implantations where you were doing pumping uh, and it was a relatively small um, implantation uh, in, in the chest. Here, all the pumps, lines, oxygenators, filters are external. Uh, and I'll show you pictures, a direct cannulation of the vena cava and aorta through uh, open chest thoracotomy. The heart is stopped, the aorta is clamped. So this is very common. We're talking thousands of procedures in the other ones. Here we're talking literally hundreds of thousands of procedures. Very common procedure, very successful, works very well. Uh, you can see here a patient would be over here, uh, surgeons here. And so this is the uh, uh, bypass uh, um, instrumentation, you've got pumps and you've got oxygenators and you've got filters uh, and all sorts of regulatory systems here. But the point is from us is that you can see all the red here uh, is basically blood in contact with an artificial surface, right? And so uh, when it sees that, then it activates. And so quite different the amount of blood exposure to an artificial surface when you're looking at something like cardiopulmonary bypass than what you're seeing with a VAD where it's only that surface of the, uh, the sort of the pump system you've got in the chest. So this shows just like a diagrammatic view of it um, with uh, blood being taken out uh, and then it goes through pumps and through an oxygenator uh, and filters uh, and then back into the patient. And then this is also showing uh, uh, where they collect the blood uh, from the pericardium during the surgery and can filter it and uh, uh, process it potentially and give it back to the patient. And this just shows sort of a view of the fact that you're using sort of direct cannulation of the heart here. Basically, you're directly cannulating uh, um, the vena cavas uh, and then directly cannulating the aorta. So an open heart procedure. So what do we do to prevent the clotting? Well, of course, we use heparin. Without anticoagulation, the CPB circuit would clot off in a few minutes, uh, and they really saw this in the very earliest days when they tried these things due to coagulation and platelet activation. They've tried coating the circuits, and that can help with heparin and, and other sort of uh, biocompatible coatings, and that can, uh, can certainly reduce some of the activation process, but certainly not enough that we would not have to anticoagulate. Uh, the trick with cardiopulmonary bypass is that they use very high dose heparin and it really shuts down clotting for the time they're on it. Uh, the heparin levels, if we're thinking about it from sort of an anti-10A uh, uh, level, if we were looking at heparin for deep venous thrombosis, uh, it's something in the range of about 0.3 to 0.7 anti-10A units per mil. If we look at heparin levels on CPB, uh, when we measured them here a number of years ago, it was on the range of about 3 to 5 units per mil, so about 10 times higher. You're giving them about 10 times more heparin than you would give somebody on DVT. So how do we get away with this? Well, it only lasts a couple of hours. Uh, and at the end of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, and the heparin is neutralized with protamine. So you give them high-dose heparin, uh, but you only use it for a few hours. So it basically shuts off coagulation very effectively during those couple of hours. So could we do this for everything else? Well, yeah, but the, remember the other things we talked about last days or weeks or months, and you really can't use this level of high-dose heparinization for that period of time uh, without getting into bleeding problems. 
How do we monitor it? Well, we use the activated clotting time. This shows sort of uh, one version of kind of an older instrument, and this is kind of the newer uh, point of care-like device. Uh, and the way we measure it is using what's called an activated clotting time. And this is essentially a whole blood sample plus a contact activator. It's a point of care test. It takes about five to 15 minutes to complete. It's typically run in the OR during cardiopulmonary bypass. This just shows some data where we were looking at uh, uh, an older version of it uh, versus a newer version, and uh, this is the data somewhere around 130 seconds. You can see here that was the baseline ACT in the patient, uh, and then they gave him the high-dose heparin, uh, and the level went up to about 500 seconds. And you can see that they got good correlation between the two devices. They both showed about the same thing, uh, and you can see that the correlation R-squared was about 0.93. So if you're giving high-dose heparin, the activated clotting time works well. It's quick, you can do it in the OR, and you can demonstrate uh, that you've given an appropriate dose of heparin and that you're giving a, getting an appropriate heparin response. So summary for sort of cardiopulmonary bypass, transient uh, bypass of heart and lungs, uh, open heart surgery required open chest, high dose heparin with reversal protamine, reliable point of care testing, activated clotting time, uh, circuit clotting prevented by high flow, high dose heparin, and limited duration. Bleeding can be an issue, but at short duration and reversal with protamine uh, usually allows hemostasis to return to normal in most patients that have good cardiac output uh, after surgery. So now let's switch to ECMO, and we'll kind of focus in some more detail um, on the, the COAG system, and what we'll talk about applies to these other systems as well, but we'll sort of focus on, on one area, uh, uh, ECMO. Uh, and there's several different names you'll hear for this use. Uh, ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. There's also extracorporeal life support, uh, and then they'll talk about extracorporeal excuse me, CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Really the, the implication here is that somebody uh, has been having CPR done to them. Uh, they've had a cardiac arrest and CPR is being done and then they've transitioned them over to ECMO. Uh, ECMO uses large percutaneous catheters to remove blood and oxygenate it and then return it uh, supporting the lungs and heart if necessary. No need for an open heart procedure to implement so it can be faster and, and somewhat easier in a sense to implement ECMO but it's a, a, a temporary solution typically for sort of days or maybe uh, a week or two at most uh, and so it's you know sort of the next step up from cardiopulmonary bypass on sort of the time scale. So introduction to sort of ECMO in general, percutaneous, like we said, catheter-based, respiratory or respiratory and cardiac support. I'll talk a little bit about the different versions. Heart is still functioning. Lungs may be ventilated as well. External pumps, oxygenators, and filters. So in that sense, it's kind of like cardiopulmonary bypass, right? All the stuff that's doing the pumping and the oxygenation, et cetera, uh, is all on the outside. Uh, duration, days to maybe weeks, uh, and, and use is something in the thousands per year. Uh, same hemostasis issue, activation of coag and platelets, circuit thrombosis is a, an issue here where you can get clots in the circuit uh, and then that can uh, need to, part or all of the circuit may need to be replaced. Uh, and then of course, the, the, always gonna be this, this balance between thrombosis in these systems and bleeding. Uh, this shows uh, from one uh, data set uh, the number of neonatal uh, ECMO runs that were being done per year. And you can see it's somewhere in about the 800 to 1,000, getting better at managing in this uh, uh, in some neonates, so it wasn't quite as high as it was back here sort of in the, the 90s. Uh, Neonatal uh, ECMO when it uh, represents about 68% uh, of the cases. Uh, respiratory is the most common. Uh, so infants whose lungs aren't functioning, you know, then they'll put them on uh, hoping that the lungs will mature. Uh, cardiac support is next most common. And then uh, using the eCPR where they've transitioned from essentially doing CPR to doing the ECMO. Uh, pediatric is about 24%, uh, cardiac and respiratory about equal uh, in this slightly older age group and then eCPR. Uh, and in adults, um, most common use is for ARDS. Uh, uh, so again, adults that are having severe uh, lung dysfunction, uh, cardiac, secondary, and uh, eCPR after that. So why is ECMO important? Uh, <clears throat> And um, Sophie, I got to know over at Children's. She was uh, 19 years old, had had a heart transplant in 2006, 
had a bad episode of rejection uh, this year, went into heart failure and then cardiac arrest at Children's. Uh, she received CPR for about 80 minutes and then they transitioned her to ECMO uh, and she was on ECMO for about six days. Uh, she recovered and she was a summer student in the lab at Children's. Uh, I'm sad to say that a couple weeks ago, um, Sophie passed away, but ECMO does work, um, but it can be improved. So for somebody like Sophie, where she needed just temporary cardiac support while they essentially got her rejection back under control again, uh, ECMO was a life-saving therapy. So the first kind of ECMO we'll talk about is venous-venous ECMO. Uh, and this is really gas exchange. This is where you don't need to support the heart, but you need to, to help oxygenate. Uh, and so basically removing blood uh, from the vena cava uh, and then uh, putting oxygenated blood back. So uh, outflow could be from the femoral vein, uh, an oxygenator, and an inflow internal jugular, for example. So you're doing oxygenation and CO2 removal. So this just shows an example of sort of a modern uh, venous venous ECMO catheter, and it can be done with a single cannula. Uh, it's really uh, quite interesting. So you can have a cannula that essentially has ports at the top and bottom that pull the venous blood in uh, that's unoxygenated, and then a port in the middle carefully positioned so it's essentially firing the oxygenated blood uh, into the heart uh, and into the ventricles. Uh, and so with one catheter, you can essentially put somebody on venous-venous uh, venous, um, ECMO and oxygenation. This is kind of what some of the catheters look like, and so uh, an arterial track and a venous track here. And then we have veno-arterial ECMO. So this is gas exchange and hemodynamic support. You're supporting cardiac output as well as gas exchange. Uh, and so uh, for veno-arterial ECMO, example, outflow could be femoral vein, an oxygenator, inflow femoral artery, uh, oxygenation, and CO2 removal, and hemodynamic support. So this just shows an example of sort of pediatric version of ECMO, a little bit different where they're putting the cannulas in the one I talked about. But essentially you have the venous side here uh, going through a pump uh, and an oxygenator, uh, a heat exchanger, and then uh, back into the uh, arterial side. Now this is what the ECMO cart looks like. And so you can see there are patients right there, right? And all this is the cart. So most of the blood's in the cart, right? Not in the patient. If you're looking at cardiopulmonary bypass, there is a, a volume, uh, and they, they've made it smaller over the years for the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit and all those tubes, but still most of the blood's in the patient, and part of it's in the circuitry. But if you're looking at a neonate, then really most of the blood's in the circuitry. So you end up priming uh, the thing with blood uh, and then attaching it to the child. Uh, and so this works very well. Uh, and we do it all the time over at Children's, uh, but you're getting the sense of how much surface area the blood is coming in contact with compared to sort of the surface area of the, of the patient. So um, anticoagulation for ECMO, do the longer duration of ECMO, days versus hours. You need lower dose. Heparin has to be used to prevent bleeding. Uh, in adults, you can actually get away with uh, no anticoagulation in some patients. Uh, high flow rates through the system uh, can actually uh, keep it free of fibrin clots in some patients. Uh, in some, you need to use heparin. Some protocols, typically about the level of heparin that we're using for DVT, so about the 0.3 to 0.7 uh, anti-10A level. Pediatrics, the issue here is lower flow rates. When you're looking at uh, an infant, the flow rate through the infant system is obviously going to be much lower. And even if they use sort of a bypass cutoff kinds of things, it's still slower flow through the system. Uh, and that leads to more risk uh, for clotting in the system. So ECMO and hemostatic activation. Well, this is kind of a repeat of that slide, just to think about it again. You're going to have areas of turbulence and shearing that can lead to platelet activation. You're going to have potentially areas that you're trying to eliminate as much as they can in the design of these things. But anywhere that we have low flow and stasis, then you have to think about worrying about clot formation there. And in the artificial surface, coag activation will occur, and it can lead to consumption of coag factors. And then we have to give them 
uh, FFP or factor concentrate. Uh, platelet activation occurs in these uh, and typically platelet counts will slowly go down, sometimes go down fast, so we give platelet transfusions. You can get complement activation and leukocyte activation. And so uh, bleeding and hemolysis can occur, leading to sort of RBC transfusion. And then if you get circuit clotting, then you have to change out the parts of the circuit that clot. So this just shows an example of what an oxygenator looks like. Uh, and this is your kind of looking into the side of it here. And you can see the, the sort of uh, black dots in here are clots that had formed in the oxygenator. And this was an interesting study where they were trying to model this uh, actually with computational fluid dynamics, looking at different flow rates and where you would potentially get areas of stasis and low flow. Uh, and so the flow rate here is red for high flow rates and low flow rates. So you can see as the blood comes in and then goes out, at high flow rates, it pretty much flushes out, and they only had small areas uh, of stasis. But with lower flow, they got larger areas where there potentially could be areas of slow flow, and that's where a clot could develop uh, in the oxygenator. And they've gone to a lot of effort to try to uh, design oxygenators that don't have areas uh, or have the limit limited possible area uh, of stasis inside them. So let's uh, look at a cartoon of what's going on on the surface. Here I've been talking about all these devices, and I'm a coag guy, right? So we got to do the coag system. Uh, so first thing that happens is proteins in the blood bind to the plastic surface of the oxygenator, the tubing, et cetera. So this is a diagram of fibrinogen molecule. That's high concentration in blood for the proteomics types. I know this well because you have to get rid of it. Uh, fibrinogen binds to the surface along with, this is factor 12. Platelets then stick to the fibrinogen. The factor 12 gets activated on the surface, forming 12A. The factor 12A can activate thrombin, and the thrombin then can activate the platelets, and then that can lead to clot formation. And if you do this with no anticoagulation, if you tested this and circulated blood through a circuit uh, that was um, recalcified, you would eventually clot off the circuit. And it doesn't uh, take that long. And that's what they saw early animal studies. Uh, they could quickly see that this wasn't going to work with no anticoagulation uh, for things like cardiopulmonary bypass. They actually, like I said, there are situations where they get away with it uh, OK uh, in adult ECMO. Um, sometimes there's some patients they can give them very little anticoagulation. So what's sort of the anticoagulation team? Well, we've got the cardiovascular surgeons and the ECMO group, uh, and they're looking at the clinical situation and providing that information. We've got pharmacy and hematology uh, helping thinking about dose adjustment, uh, and we've got lab medicine sort of helping with test interpretation. And so it really takes, you know, a team approach to help think about these patients in the hospital and what's the best way to sort of balance their bleeding and clotting problems. So let's talk a little bit about the more detail on the anticoagulation. Heparin anticoagulates by binding to and accelerating the activity of antithrombin. Uh, I all remember when I first learned about this, I wondered, uh, gee, it was nice that uh, nature built the antithrombin molecule so that when we invented heparin, it would have something to attach to. Uh, and they said, well, it doesn't really work that way. It turns out your endothelial cells are coated with a heparin-like molecule, heparan. And so what you want to think about is a normal blood vessel has essentially like a heparin coating, and antithrombin is then bound to that. So you have high-speed antithrombin coating all your vessels. And it's one of the mechanisms why ours don't clot like it does on these artificial surfaces. So heparin anticoagulation then becomes a balance between the heparin level in the blood, the patient's antithrombin level, and the patient's coagulation factor level. So sort of in the cartoon here, antithrombin binds to heparin, and then this is accelerated, and that destroys thrombin. And so these are really the three things that we're looking at constantly to try to think about what is the status of this patient, and what should we do? And then, like I said, remember, we have to look at sort of what the clinical outcome and the clinical is going on. If the patient's bleeding, then that's the input we need, and, and then we're going to adjust it one way. If they're seeing circuit clotting, then it's going another way. So we've got the clinical situation. We've got these things. If the patient's antithrombin level drops low enough, then the heparin won't work. You can try this on our standard sort of anti-10A assay. The, the ones we typically use now don't have heparin or don't have antithrombin in the assay. They are based on the antithrombin in the patient. And if you just put heparin in the assay, not blood, not plasma, but just heparin uh, without anything else in it, you'll get a zero. 
because there's no antithrombin there that it's accelerating. And so you really are, are sort of balancing these things. And it's important to know that the, most of the anti-10A uh, assays are really measuring anti-10A heparin complex levels. So if the antithrombin goes down, that will go down if the heparin level goes down. And then the other piece, of course, is coag factor levels. If you have a patient that has low levels of coag factors because they've been consumed or they were on warfarin or uh, for whatever reason, then that puts them at more risk for bleeding because this side of the equation is going to be shutting down coag, sort of proportional to how much can be made. If you can't make as much, then you're enhancing the operation on that side. So it's really balancing these three things to try to get an adequate level of antithrombosis activity without making the patient bleed. So this is kind of the cartoon. Again, these things stick, platelets bind, factor 12A activates, thrombin will get formed, and then the antithrombin destroys it. And if we can have enough on board uh, to prevent um, clotting in the circuit while the patient still has uh, enough uh, thrombin generation that they can prevent bleeding. So how do we monitor? Well, the current standard for monitoring ECMO utilizes the activated clotting time in most centers. In a one survey, it was about 97% of centers use the ACT at some level. Uh, the ACT is fast. Uh, it's the same assay that they're using or similar version. Sometimes it's a different cartridge. It's point of care. It works well in CPV with high heparin. The problem is that the ACT is less sensitive to low-dose heparin than other methods, and evidence is beginning to accumulate that it may not be the optimal monitor. Uh, if we look at sort of what things affect different assays, we have coag factor levels, antithrombin, heparin, lupus inhibitors, and more common in adults, uh, contact activator that's used, hematocrit and platelet count. For the pro-time, it's really only sensitive to the coag factor level. An antithrombin assay really only measures antithrombin. The heparin level, like we said, it's measuring really antithrombin heparin complex. So it's sensitive to both the antithrombin level and the heparin level. If we look at the PTT, it's going to be sensitive to coag factors, antithrombin and heparin, and potentially things like the lupus inhibitor. If we look at the ACT, it's sensitive to all of those. It's also sensitive to the type of activator used in the assay and to hematocrit and to platelet count. Since there's platelets in the assay and we're using lower dose heparin, then when the platelets activate in the assay, they can neutralize part of the heparin that's present. The platelet factor four that's released potentially can neutralize it. Now, what about CPV? Because we said it worked well. Well, the dose is so high that it essentially overwhelms all of these other effects, and you see a big change in the ACT, perfectly adequate to tell you that you've given a big dose of heparin, and so ACT works well for monitoring CPV. What about ECMO? Well, the problem is when we use much lower doses of heparin, we then get into the problem that it's sensitive to all of these things. It will change with the platelet count. It'll change with hematocrit alterations. It'll change with antithrombin level. What we're really trying to do is use the ACT, again, to monitor how much heparin we would give, but all of these things are affecting it to some level. So for example, platelet count will have an effect on heparin neutralization. Uh, that's why in the PTT with heparins, uh, with platelets removed, that kind of issue is taken out. Hematocrit is an interesting issue here that, remember, all of this is a plasma effect, right? These are all things that are going on in the plasma, but the hematocrit just displaces a certain amount of plasma. So in other words, when we do our standard coag test, it's 100% plasma. When we're doing a whole blood test, part of it is red cells and platelets, et cetera, white cells, and that varies, and therefore it varies the amount of plasma in the assay. But the assay assumes, actually, that the plasma is always the same, but it isn't. It varies with crit. You could see this. We did one study uh, uh, sort of looking at this with our own coag instruments and could show that, uh, essentially, if you gave the patient a, a red cell transfusion, that their clotting times got longer on whole blood tests because it simply displaced part of the plasma in the sample. So that makes the ACT a little bit trickier. And this shows uh, sort of correlation between uh, anti-10A levels, heparin levels, and ACT. And this study uh, on uh, ECMO patients, there was uh, essentially no correlation between the two. Uh, P-value is 0.41, uh, rho about uh, 0.1. Uh, and so this is not that it isn't trying to respond to the heparin. It responds to high-dose heparin. And the ACT can show you if you've really gone too high on ECMO. Uh, 
Um, but, but in the, the range that we're often using for ECMO, particularly the lower end of the range, then it struggles because it's insensitive to the effect of heparin itself, uh, and it's sensitive to sort of too many things. So ECMO is highly complex, risky, expensive, but potentially life-saving. Works well in many cases, but any thrombotic therapy and monitoring could be improved. Uh, important to learn from every patient in situations like this. So we've instituted a research study at Children's to monitor sort of ACT and other assays to evaluate which are predicting the uh, best at predicting the risk of bleeding and uh, circuit thrombosis. So here's one alternate approach that uh, some other places are using. Uh, Texas Children's uh, in Houston is doing something like this. Everybody's a little bit different. There's no uh, you know, perfect standard protocol uh, that people have found, but essentially uh, looking at a heparin activity, an anti-10A assay, look, which, like we said, measures heparin antithrombin complex, uh, base heparin dose adjustments on that, uh, use a pro-time to assess coag factor levels. If the pro-time's normal, uh, coag factors are probably normal, uh, and then maintain the heparin activity in sort of an expected range. If the PTT is prolonged, suggesting that factors are low, uh, consider FFP, and then utilize potentially the PTT to assess the combined effect of coag factors and heparin. And uh, what they were doing is trying to keep the PTT below about 150 uh, and keep the heparin in range if possible. So this is that balancing act. Don't have the heparin too high that they're going to bleed from it, uh, but don't let the heparin go too low so that they'll start clotting. If heparin is not increasing as expected with dose change, uh, then check an AT3 level and consider AT3 infusion. So again, what we're trying to balance is heparin, antithrombin, and coag factor levels. So this is sort of more recent research on some of these topics. 65% um, of ECMO centers are now measuring heparin activity as part of their overall panel. Uh, heparin activity correlates with heparin dose. Uh, better than the ACT, that's, that's not unexpected, uh, since this is really a, a closer measure just to the heparin. Heparin activity predicted circuit, circuit clotting better than ACT in one study. They were really saying that you really had to maintain sort of a minimum level of, of heparin activity to prevent clotting. Uh, predicted um, bleeding better as well if the heparin activity went too high. Uh, than that predicted bleeding. Uh, ACT use uh, often led to under-heparinization in one study, and that heparin activity resulted in fewer heparin adjustments in blood draws. Now, what are the other possibilities? Let's think a little outside the box. So that's kind of standard therapy we've talked about. It works, it works pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, if you get ECMO today, uh, you're likely, uh, and you have something that's reversible, uh, the systems we have work, but there are potential always to make it better because this is still an area that we struggle with. Uh, another potential that some people have looked at is to use of an alternate anticoagulant. One version of this would be something like direct thrombin inhibitors. These are things like argatribine and bivalirudin. They bind to and inhibit thrombin in the blood uh, and, are, and thrombin that's bound to the clot. Heparin therapy really requires monitoring of three things we talked about, heparin, antithrombin, and coag factor levels. Uh, direct thrombin inhibitors would re require really monitoring of just two things, the direct thrombin inhibitor and the coag factor level. So a little bit simpler potentially. Uh, really, there's only a small amount of data on this. Uh, it's clearly not evidence that these are uh, unquestionably better, but it's simply something that might uh, warrant further study in the future. Uh, these drugs are usually used in patients who need ECMO or CPB or something else, and there's a concern for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, so they don't want to use heparin, and so they will use one of these other drugs. Uh, one study of bivalirudin in 12 pediatric patients uh, indications were heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, heparin resistance, clotting on heparin, unstable ACTs. Uh, and what they found was that bivalirudin was essentially equivalent to heparin in this study. They didn't see more bleeding or more thrombosis than they were expecting. Another study of looking at uh, heparin versus bivalirudin, again, small study, about 10 patients in each side. Uh, less bleeding, they said, in the bivalirudin group and reduced transfusions, but very small study. That's why, you know, we were saying it really needs to be we need to learn from every patient because there, there aren't that many of them in each, <clears throat> in each institution. So is this something potentially to consider? Well, it could be. Uh, at least the little bit of preliminary data we've got is it that it's no worse. It may be slightly better, and we would have to do controlled trials to see if it, if it really offered an advantage. So the last part we'll talk about here is really the future. 
Uh, this, there aren't uh, drugs yet in develop, uh, uh, available, but there are drugs in development, and I think this is really an interesting area. And this would be to develop uh, anti-factor 12, uh, either as an antibody or a small molecule would probably be the best. So the idea here is, using the cartoon again, these things would bind, fibrinogen and 12 would bind to the surface. Uh, platelets would bind, uh, 12 would activate, but then the 12 inhibitor would block the 12. And so you would never get thrombin generated from the 12. Why is this interesting? Well, let's talk a little bit about it. I won't go into too much painful detail on the contact system, uh, but uh, contact or calocrine kinin system really consists of three parts. We'll just mention it briefly. Precalocrine getting activated to calocrine, high molecular weight kininogen to bradykinin, and factor 12 to factor 12A. Uh, then factor 12A activates 11, and that activates the coic system. Why are we interested in this? Because this system is what activates, at least in part, we talked about lots of things that happen when you put somebody on an artificial surface, but this is one of the things that activates on that surface is the contact system. Uh, and what's interesting is that hereditary deficiencies of these proteins are not associated with bleeding or clotting. People who are homozygous deficient in 12 or high molecular weight kininogen or precalocrine, they don't bleed and they really don't clot. It seems that this system is sort of an evolutionary leftover in us and other mammals, useful you know, in other creatures, but kind of got dragged along to us. And if you're completely deficient in these, you'll have a PTT that's 100 seconds and you don't bleed. Now see, that's interesting because it means if you shut the darn thing off and it's not working, you probably won't bleed either, right? If I injected you with an antibody that shut off 12, you wouldn't bleed. Or if you had a small molecule, you wouldn't bleed. So what would happen if we gave this to somebody on an artificial system? Well, it would shut this down if we were lucky, but they probably wouldn't bleed. So that would really be a very interesting anticoagulant to use, or antithrombotic, really. It really wouldn't be an anticoagulant, you know. It would be an antithrombotic. And so the idea is shut off that, and you'll block this, at least for this part of the system. So in animal models, ECMO and rabbits, anticoagulant uh, comparison was done with heparin uh, versus uh, anti-factor 12A. Uh, the 12A antibody prevented fibrin deposition and clot formation similar to the heparin, but the anti-12A had no effect on hemostatic capacity, no increased bleeding from wounds, uh, whereas heparin showed a 20-fold increase in blood loss from wounds. So you got an antithrombotic effect without an anti-hemostatic effect. Uh, if, if these sorts of drugs worked out, it would be interesting to see if they would uh, work in humans on essentially all of the types of things we've talked about, whether it's artificial heart or, or ventric ventricular assist devices, ECMO or CPB. So summary, uh, heparin is routinely used in an anticoagulant for cardiopulmonary support of all types. Uh, for low-dose heparin, uh, LVAD and ECMO, monitoring with heparin activity may improve anticoagulant control. Uh, use of direct trauma inhibitors may simplify anticoagulant monitoring and reduce bleeding. Don't really know this. It's something we'd have to study. There's some preliminary data that says it might be worth looking at. And future development of factor 12A inhibitors may help prevent clotting in all forms of cardiopulmonary support without increasing bleeding. And I think that's probably the one in the future uh, that uh, really deserves a lot of, of looking at. You could even imagine it if it was inexpensive enough uh, being used to prevent clotting around things like central venous catheters and things like that. So very interesting. So thank you for your attention and um, open things for questions. <laughs>